My research, a big focus of my research has been on lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender youth, or sexual minority youth, or sometimes queer youth, depending on who we're talking about and how we're doing the, how we're doing the research. And I studied sociology, actually, my degree is in sociology, in uh, life course aging demography, and was really, I was trained to be a family sociologist, but <clears throat> I was at Chapel Hill as a postdoc um, when the Ad Health study was being fielded, the very first wave of the National Longitudinal Study of Adolescent Health. And with, some, with another postdoc there, uh, learned about the study and learned that in that national study they had asked questions about same-sex romantic attractions of, in a national study of teenagers, 20,000 kids. And at that time there were literally a handful of published studies about uh, gay and lesbian youth, um, mostly gay boys. Uh, that, that had demonstrated significant uh, mental health risk, specifically suicide risk. But there wasn't any, uh, there were very few, there was, at that time there had just been published a population study uh, in one state. And this was the first national data. And um, so my colleague and I thought, well this is interesting. And so we wondered, well, they, they just asked the kids, Do you, have you ever had a romantic attraction to a male? Have you ever had a romantic attraction to the female? And so we thought, well, I wonder if any of the boys said yes to male and girls said yes to female. Of course, I, of course I knew that they would have been. <laughs> and um, we uh, did our first paper that just documented suicide risk among, among same-sex attracted kids um, that we published in the American Journal of Public Health in, two, in, in 2000. Um, and that was the first national, you know, sort of population-based uh, study. And from there, I really set out to document um, the risk that w had been talked about for so long, but for which we didn't really have much data about. Um, at that time, there was this sort of, uh, the, the, the discussion was that the, that the research on gay kids was sort of discounted as being oh, but only based on community samples in urban cities in community-based organizations that, that serve queer kids and sort of no wonder those kids might be more vulnerable because they've sought out that program they may be the most vulnerable kids and so I sort of set out to try to document the risk that we had been seeing in those studies um, with national data um, and so I published a series of papers on suicide on victimization um, and on substance use and abuse um, at the time, I thought that I was being strategic uh, because I wanted to sort of put to rest there's no good data documenting risk with the idea of, uh, from my point of view, I'm saying let's think about, let's now like put that uh, uh, discounting of the research to rest and focus on what we can do to support LGBT young people in their communities. Of course, what happened was there was an interesting change in the rhetoric because of that research that I contributed to, which was a pathologization of gay youth, um, sort of uh, a new rhetoric that is, okay, so then, you know, it's, it's bad to be a gay kid. It's dangerous to be a gay kid. So, um, I mean, it's interesting how our research takes on a life of its own. And so it's since, in, since the, the late 90s, early 2000s, I've sort of been interested then in to returning to the sociology uh, that I was trained in of trying to understand the lives of LGBT young people. Um, by situating them in the context of their family, schools, communities, faith communities. And that's really been the program I, of my research um, since, since those, that sort of first set of work that was really designed to, to, to document risk. Um, and I'd say the interesting thing about, <clears throat> one, one important thing to realize about this area of work for people that are interested in it is that we still know so little about what actually could make a difference um, in, in, in changing and really changing the stakes for kids. Um, <clears throat> there is very little, almost no, prevention intervention uh, uh, efficacy research uh, that, that demonstrates what could be done to actually make positive change. And so that is a huge thing, I think, for the next 10 years. We have now about a decade worth of good research that identifies risk protective factors, mechanisms of support and, and risk. Um, and I think we're really now at the point of saying, let's really begin to think about how do we test uh, some of those, some of what we've learned in a, and try, try to actually change, you know, identify things that we could alter in kids' environments to try to, try to make things better. Um, and I think the other really interesting moment <coughs> that we're in is, of course, there's, in the last decade, there's been 
extraordinary social change around LGBT people, lives, and issues. And so one of the questions I get a lot, and I just would share here, and I'm starting to write about this, is why is this still an issue? Um, if we have states that have gay marriage or civil unions, if we have such extraordinary, um, such really unprecedented social change in things like the general S social survey national opinions about the acceptability of homosexuality in society, um, uh, I often hear from folks, well, if things are so much better, if things have changed so much, why do we still care about what's going on? Um, well, you know, is it really that bad for LGBT young people? And I think one of the things that um, I've been thinking a lot about and that is important, um, the, 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 the part of my, uh, as I, I'm an adolescent development researcher, and um, this to me is where the family science and the developmental science come together. Because I, I think what we've seen in the last decade, um, because of the growing social awareness of LGBT issues, um, gay kids are coming out at younger ages. Um, younger all the time. So it used to be there was no such thing as a gay high school student and now that's just, I mean there's no such thing as a high school without a gay student. And now that's becoming more true of middle schools and junior high schools. And I think what we know developmentally is that, and there's debate about this and I'm not going to get into it, but we could talk forever about whether these developmental changes are social, whether the structure of our schools and the transition to junior high school creates a, a, cult, a, a cultural setting where kids are less open to difference or whether there are real true cognitive uh, developmental differences that have to do with the development of metacognition and kids um, lack of ability uh, to respect um, difference or their or their real um, uh, accentuated uh, interest in conformity uh, and social regulation but what we know is that gay kids are <laughs> kids are coming out at younger and younger ages and all the developmental work tells us that it is right around that pre-puberty, puberty age that kids are less accepting of difference. So I think it's a really interesting cultural moment so that when folks from the outside sort of, you know, the adults say, well, gee, aren't things so much better? I actually think in a lot of ways the stakes are higher uh, for kids and for schools. And so it's really, it is imperative that we get it right, that we figure out what we need to do in schools, communities, families to create settings to support kids. So I think that's... Um, excited about the next 10 years to see what we learn.